Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having the opportunity to present our work uh, in here. So my name is Hector Calvo. I'm currently at the University of Southampton. And this is joint work with uh, Luca Rondel, who is the person to blame if you don't like the paper, and Daria Tass, who is my second PhD student, who is right now uh, in the job market. So I'm going to talk about something that is uh, very loosely related to uh, the theme of the conference that is entitled Subjective Return Expectations, Information and uh, Stock Market Participation, Evidence from France. So first, uh, let me broadly motivate um, what is the, the overall agenda for this project of which this paper is just the first step. So basically, since I visited NYU in 2006, after finishing my PhD with Roger Guénery, uh, sometimes Alberto, who was very kind to invite me, would jump out of his office and see me working with some strange empirical papers. I was supposed to work on theory with him, and this is what I was doing. So what I was doing was, so we have been trying to design, collect, and exploit data which is actually field survey longitudinal data in order to empirically assess expectational coordination. And this is different from um, the experimental approach that you have seen this morning by Florian. And this is also different from most of the theoretical work um, that you will see all through the conference. Now, in particular, we are interested in financial markets. So, um, and the reason for that was that once I completed my PhD thesis with Roger, I thought, well, when I was trying to present my job market paper out there, everybody looked at me and said, but why do we care? Does this matter in reality? I mean, expectational coordination is a very important issue, but sometimes we fail to show to people that this may also uh, matter empirically. So, Together with Luke, who was crazy enough to believe in me, we started designing all these surveys. And obviously, if we believe that expectational coordination matters, the first thing that we need to show is that expectations are actually heterogeneous in the data. So the first question we, we ask ourselves is whether unconditional subjective return expectations are actually heterogeneous. And the answer is yes, and was provided by a very nice paper by uh, Jeff Dominitz and Chuck Mansky in the Journal of the European Economic Association in 2007. Now, but why is it that expectations are um, heterogeneous? Expectations about the return to invest in the stock market. This is what I'm going to deal with. Well, one explanation is that since um, the information about the evolution of the stock market is publicly available, it must be that people use different learning rules, okay? Different updating rules of their expectations. So is this what is going on? And the answer is yes, again, and was provided by Jeff Dominitz and Chuck Mansky in their 2011 Journal of Applied Econometrics paper, where they identified three different categories of people using um, the American Life Panel amongst households. Um, some of which were of the persistent type, some of which were random workers, and some of which were of the mean reversion type. Um, this is something that we are currently working on also with uh, Luc and um, another co-author, which is uh, Shisco Oliver. But this paper in particular, what tries is to provide a different answer to why is it that expectations are heterogeneous. And the answer is that despite of information being publicly available, individuals have heterogeneous information sets, upon which they form different expectations. Um, so this is what I'm talking to talk about, I'm going to talk about today. Now, where are we going with that? Well, the next step is how do people revise expectations over the, life, over the business cycle as more information shows up, once we have established that they have um, a different degree of knowledge of what is going on regarding financial return. And in particular, uh, in the 2011 survey wave, we will be able to identify if there is a strategic component in expectations, in individual subjective return expectations. And by a strategic component, I mean something that is completely related to 
the theme of this workshop, which is um, second order beliefs. So when I believe, when I expect the stock market to go up, do I take into account what do others expect for that as well? Now, rather than undertaking a very indirect route, what we're going to do is to take advantage of Helwig and Belkamp's insight that establishes a one-to-one -one mapping between information acquisition and the game that investors might be playing, either a game with strategic substitutes or a game with strategic complements. So that would inform us whether the average investor in the stock market perceives the stock market as a game with strategic substitute abilities or as a game with strategic complementarities. There, the difference is very simple. So do, I believe, so do investors invest today because they believe that the price of assets today is low, so that assets are underpriced? In that case, they want to buy what others don't buy. And this is a game with strategic substitutes. The polar case would be that Investors believe that the stock market is a game with strategic complements in which all of the things equal they buy today because they expect the price tomorrow to go up. In which case, if they see others buying, they would like to buy as well. Okay. The implication of this paper, of this theoretical paper, is that in, if the stock market is a game with strategic substitutes, then they want to be informed about what others don't know. They should be investing into private signals. Whereas if it is a game with strategic complements, they want to know what others know. All right? And we have questions to pin that down. So we ask respondents, what is the fraction of the French population that is informed, that is informed about the evolution of the stock market according to them? And what is the fraction of the French population that they believe is investing in the stock market. But this is for another presentation in the future. Because in the end, what we have is a strategy where we want to understand from modeling individual behavior what happens in the aggregate so that we can run a quantitative exercise using realistic data on expectations information and how do people revise them. So what is the specific motivation of this paper? It is that household choices are poorly understood. And in particular, if we examine what happens um, through the life cycle, what we see is that age portfolio profiles are hump shaped by age, which means that the young and the old do not participate, do not invest in the stock market, whereas the middle age do on average. On top of that, we observe that households' portfolios are either missing, which means that they do not invest, or incomplete, which means that portfolios are formed by a, a very small subset of uh, assets, which is against uh, risk diversification and so on and so forth. So today's consensus is that transaction and information costs are the most important quantitatively. But at least in the framework of these um, dynamic life cycle portfolio choice models with a representative agent, the assumption of information costs seems slightly at odds with the assumption of rational expectations that they need in order to close the model. So what we do in here, in this paper in particular, is try to answer whether Households' expectations conform with choices, but given what they know. So the main novelty of what we do in here is we try to come up with a novel measure of information at the individual level that has a quantitative dimension and that can be compared across households. And then we, okay, since this is a novel data set, what we are going to do is we are going to replicate Dominic Sanmansky's work which was done only for the old, exploiting data from the health and retirement study, but on our representative sample of households by age and wealth. Right? Okay, so where do I put this paper in the literature? Where specifically, uh, because of the way in which we are going to measure individual expectations at the household level, 
we're going to borrow the methodology from the subjective, from the subjective belief elicitation that was, has been there since the late 90s and that was put forward by uh, Chuck Mansky and various co-authors and PhD students. Okay? And essentially what we are going to do is we're going to extend that methodology in order to measure information sets in a very simple and trivial way, we believe. Now, but what are we doing in the, in the end? So what we are doing is using a representative sample to check whether the most and simplest portfolio choice model predictions is consistent with what we see once we have control for everything we can think of. So to that extent, what we are, so to that extent this is finance. It is not behavioral finance. Because we are going to add a set of controls because life is complex. And they are supposed to control for all those factors that households may take into account when they want to make a decision. Okay? And then what we want is to see whether the expectations about the future return explains whether they invest or not today. That's the idea. And on top of that, it is going to be a conditional expectation. So I'm going to condition on the information that households hold, actually. Yes? Question? So I still have uh, 15 minutes. Oh, no, you still have, no, no, you still have more than 10. No, no, but I'm not going to go up to 47. Don't worry. <laughs> yes, no, no, no. I have something like uh, 25 to go over. The rest are appendices. Yeah. So I'm going to jump the outline, because now I am stressed as well. So this is the very basic model um, the, the basic two-asset portfolio choice model. And I am just going to deal with the participation condition because I'm only going to focus on the extensive margin, all right? And this very basic model, either in its static version by Arrow or in its dynamic versions by Merton and Samuelson, predict that individuals should invest today if they expect a positive return over their investments on top of the best alternative that they have, which is bonds or the riskless asset, All right? So what do we do? So we collected some funds from the INR and then we hired a professional survey agency in order to administer a survey uh, with questions on attitudes, preferences, expectations, and socio socio-economic and demographic characteristics to a representative sample of 4,000 households. Respondents have to fill a questionnaire and send it back to the post. The way in which we elicit subjective beliefs is we ask them about the likely evolution of the French stock market index, which is the CAC 40, five years ahead in time relative to the time of the survey, which was March 2007, and so before the crisis, and well before anybody could anticipate that, and we were extremely lucky about that, I have to say. So how do we elicit information? Well, we simply just ask the same question, but regarding the recent past evolution. So according to them, um, by how much did the stock market go up over the previous five years? So on, from March 2002 to March 2007. Now, this is a graph that depicts the evolution of the index since July 1987 until July 2011. And the vertical bars, the red one is March 2007, so where the index was by March 2007. And the vertical green line represents where the index was by March 2002. The index had gone up by 20% in between for the last five years, so that the researcher, us, know the truth. Okay? Now, what we don't know is how much do respondents know about that. Now, this is the question format. So, five years from now, do you think that the stock market will have increased by more than 25%, K1, 
will have increased by 10 to 25, will have increased by less than 10%, and so on and so forth. And individuals had to uh, distribute 100 points amongst these different categories, which meant that we, would, we were able to elicit individual PDFs to which individuals themselves had to bound as well. So what was the maximum, what is the maximum percentage increase they expect? What is the minimum percentage increase they expect? They choose those. Huh? They choose the alignment. Yes, they choose it themselves. We ask them to provide us with uh, the max and the mean. So as I said, since this is a novel data set and we were worried about problems, um, what we did, sorry, um, so what we did is relative to the past is exactly the same question format as this one, but over the last five years, all right? So that basically what we are inquiring is about, so each category, the, if, suppose that they, had, they put 50 points in the category, it, in five years time, I expect the index to stay where it is today. So we are actually asking them about that relative likelihood, and this is the, the formalization of the question. What is the, the index percentage change for the future and over the last five years as well? So same thing. Now, how do they answer? So here we have the average on the left for the forward-looking expectations, and on the right-hand side we have the average of their answers Relative, what hap relative to what happened, okay? So for example, what you have is that around 40% expect that in five years time, by March 2007, they would expect that by March 2012, the stock market index would be more or less where it was in March 2007, all right? So, but overall we can see that they are relatively pessimistic if we compare with historical data for the index and we computed those using a five year uh, moving window, rolling window, since uh, 1981. But when it comes to what do they know, it turns out that around 25%, which is the the peak in the right-hand side distribution were relatively well informed because they had answered that the index over the last five years has gone up by between 10 and 25 percentage points when the truth is that it had gone up by 20 percent, okay? The rest of them are, strictly speaking, uninformed, but on average they are not that badly informed. Those that are really uninformed are the guys let's say that say that over the last five years, the stock market has stayed where it is in March 2007, or it has gone down. That is clearly wrong. So, well, when we compute the first two moments, the mean and the, vary and the standard deviation, we obtain something similar. And because of time, um, I'm going to, um, to skip it. Just one thing that is worth mentioning. So if we compare the standard deviation for forward-looking expectations to the standard deviation for what actually happened, which is not my expectations in the previous year, we can see that the standard deviation is first too low relative to the historical mean, which is around 0.19 as opposed to 0.068. But it is nevertheless higher for the future relative to the past, okay, which provides some consistency. Um, so this means that the guys are not crazy. They are unsure about what actually happened, but they are less unsure than what, relative to what they think it will happen, which is truly uncertain. Now, so in order to validate our data set, what we do is we just construct the same measure as Dominic and Mansky, which they label PNR, which is simply what is the probability that the stock market is going to go up over the next five years. Now, to give you an order of magnitude of why do we need to do that is because they basically exploited data from the health and retirement study in, uh, in the rank for 15,166 households aged in between 50 and 80. We only have 1988 households in that age bracket. So 
we thought that we, we needed to take our data care, I mean, with care. So how do we compute this probability? Well, we just sum the relative likelihoods to the first three outcomes, right? So easy to do. Now, what are the differences? The differences is that first, we use a different horizon. We use five years as opposed to one year, which is a standard in the literature. And the reason for that is twice. We want basically to reduce the sensibility of answers to first business cycle conditions prevailing at the time of the survey, which we had little control over that. So we designed the survey in 2006. The data uh, was collected in 2007. We had no idea in 2006 how would the stock market look like in 2007. But second, um, we need also to take care of inertia in portfolio management because something that we know is that we don't know with which horizon do households invest in the stock market. If it is one year, three years, we know that there is strong evidence of inertia or, for example, the portfolios of academicians being revised every three years, being rebalanced every three years on average, once. So, and what we obtain is less 50-50 type of answers, which in the literature are taken as a symptom of extreme uncertainty. We also use a different elicitation methodology, more in line with what the Bank of Italy does, but this is because of the survey format. In the health and retirement study, they do it by phone, we do it by the post. The next two points are important because on the one hand, so we have a representative sample by age and also by wealth. And this tackles two important open questions in the literature, which is that we don't know why is it that the young do not invest in the stock market when they should. And the second is why is it that the rich do not invest in the stock market? I mean, or not as much as a um, dynamic portfolio choice model with uh, transaction costs would predict. Because given that the guys are rich, transaction costs are peanuts for them, so they should all go and invest in the stock market if they are aware of the existence of an equity premium. So, and finally, and the most important novelty of what we do is that we um, measure individual information sets in order to capture both differences in information across households, but also what is the relationship between information and expectations. Okay, and to that extent, what we define is the equivalent measure of the uh, positive nominal return variable for the future, but for the past. So what is the probability that the stock market did actually go up over the last five years? All right. So how does stock market participation look like in France as per March 2007? What you can see is that the young and the old do not invest, the middle age essentially invest. Now, how does our data on expectations look like by age? So on the left-hand side, you have the mean probability that the stock market would go up by age category. And what you can see is that they also look broadly hump-shaped. So the young and the old are more pessimistic than the middle age. When we examine and decompose that by gender, what we find is something that is also in the literature, which is that males in blue are more optimistic than females for all ages, basically. And this is what is the basis of the overconfidence literature in finance. What about uh, wealth and education? Well, as you can see from the left-hand side, this is the, the mean probability that the stock market would go up by wealth. You can see that the wealthier you are, the more optimistic you are. From the right-hand side, we have plotted it by education as well because education is typically taken as a proxy in the literature for information. So what you can see and is striking is that the educated in red are only marginally more optimistic than the uneducated in blue, but that both become more optimistic as they age. So age appears as a very important determinant. Now, what does it happen when it comes to um, information, which is the novelty. Information, again, by age. So what you can see clearly is that the young, the young do not know about by how much has the stock market gone up. They are clearly wrong. 
you can also see that if you proxy information by our measure, to acquire the information takes time through the life cycle, okay? Which is consistent with some old paper published in the NBR as a working paper by King and Lip, but never published in the literature, and by Hertz conjecture in, her, in his survey uh, annual review of economics paper. Now, we also learned from the second picture by gender that it might be that males are more optimistic because actually they happen to be better informed than females. Okay, so on average, males in blue are better informed than females for all ages. Now, with wealth, well, me the median wealth level in France is around 100,000 euros. So you can see that the first uh, in increasing stream says that the richer you are, the wealthier you are, the more informed you are. And then it gets more or less constant. But it's around 70%, which is a pretty good guess on average for what has happened. Although there is some uh, disagreement that increases in the future. Now, when it comes to compare the educated in red and the uneducated, what you can see is that both are similarly informed when it comes to the relevant information necessary to invest in the stock market. So that education is not a very good proxy. All right, so then what we do, since all these things might be correlated with everything else, so we specified a probit econometric specification where we try to control for all those complexities that affect households and that have been highlighted in the literature on household portfolios, like endowments, constraints, um, information problems, or inertia measures, and we focus on, so we have also some measures from preferences, and we focus on our main target, which is whether expectations, and in particular conditional expectations of the stock market going up, determines my decision to invest today in the stock market. Okay, so since my guess is that probably you don't see much, so the variable that proxies for expectations is on the first, is the first one, okay? And it, it is in all columns. So what do we do here in column one is to examine the robustness of Dominic and Mansky's results using our data set, their methodology, but a representative sample by age. And they are expectations determine decisions. Then we include our, in column two, we include our information proxy and we see that it matters, but we have not yet accounted for other information proxies like education, which is what we include in column three or for measures of endowments or of transaction costs that we include also in column four, and for all other factors that capture preferences and um, constraints and inertial factors. And you can see that at the end, expectations matter, but information as well. So those who invest in the stock market are not only those that expect the stock market to go up, but it is also those who know that the stock market has gone up in the past, all right? So I will be back to column seven, but the important thing to remember in here is that then in column seven what we do is we repeat the same thing, but we use information as a proxy for expectations, right? And then in column seven what we answer is, is it the case that the, the expectations of those that are informed determine their decision to invest in the stock market? And the answer is yes, and the effect is multiplied by seven, and the, the instrument is valid and is exogenous. Now, what happens when we decompose by age? So when, when we run exactly the same exercise, but examining only the old as opposed to the young. So what you can see is that this is the column that matters, and this is for the instrumentation, all right? What you can see is that expectations determine their decisions but not the information. And the reason is, if you remember the informational graph by age, is that they are all more or less equally informed. So there is no heterogeneity there to exploit. What does it happen with the young, the converse? So look at column six. So in column six, when we control for everything, what it turns out is that amongst the young, what explains whether they invest or not in stocks is whether they are informed about what has happened. Now, the important thing of column seven is that here, since we use information as an instrument for 
forward-looking expectations, observe that the effect is now statistically very significant and has been multiplied by five. The reason for that is that it is not whether you are informed or not. It is the expectations of those who are informed that determine choices. All right now, the strategy that we followed in order to find the instrument was to take advantage of Gerard Genot's uh, separation theorem in his 1986 Journal of Finance paper that studies dynamic optimal portfolio choice under incomplete information. And basically under two conditions, one is that agents are infinitesimal and second, that the size of their investment does not provide a more informative signal to them, then you can decompose the agent's problem into two. In the first stage, the agent estimates the expected return using the information that he has. And in the second stage, he chooses the optimal portfolio, plugging in his own individual assessment. This is exactly what has guided our choice of instrument. Um, so this is what, we'd have been, what we have done in column seven of the previous tables. So what are the conclusions? Well, elicited subjective stock market expectations can explain age portfolio profiles at the extensive margin, which confirms Dominic and Mansky's results for the, for the old, but also for the overall population, okay? Now, conditioning on information, we have seen that the young do not invest because they are not aware of there being an equity premium or of their investment opportunities that the stock market offers, thereby proving Hertz conjecture. Second, it seems that the relevant information that you need in order to invest in the stock market is slowly acquired through um, the life cycle. Now, I, I have recently come to find some papers in finance uh, that deal with learning by trading. This is what I think is going on. Okay, so for you to be a Bayesian updater, you need to know for sure what has happened and then you revise your expectations. What our picture of information shows is that, at least for the young, they have very imperfect knowledge. So they do, they do not take what it ha has happened seriously on average, okay? So there is, they treat objective information with some suspicion, but they nevertheless acquire more, which makes them have a more optimistic belief regarding the, uh, the expected returns of investing in the stock market, and this also translates into them being more likely to invest in the stock market as they age. Okay? Now, what we see here is against a trust explanation, because we are controlling for trust in these regressions, and because if something we know from our data is that trust, if anything, only gets worse with age. Okay? But information gets better with age. So, Elicited subjective stock market expectations are empirically heterogeneous. They are also time varying and they are correlated with past information. And they can quantitatively explain why is it that so many people do not invest in the stock market. And if, we, if I had some policy recommendations to give, it would be target the young and give them the info. Now, our results are robust because we don't have any reverse causality since we measure directly information or we proxy it in a coherent and we believe um, natural way. However, we have a problem which comes from inertia. Okay? Despite of having extended the horizon in order to see um, with which, in order to, to be able, I mean, in order to be more likely to capture the right horizon with which households make decisions, uh, we have not exploited the panel dimension here, but we will. I mean, this is something that we can do now. Finally, um, they are quantitatively very important because they also explain conditional asset demands, which is something that the literature has not managed to. Okay. So conditional on participating, how much do you invest? The standard model predicts that the expected return and risk should matter. But since typically in the literature nobody has examined 
cross-sectionally these differences because they were all implicitly assuming rational expectations. They were all the same and they dropped out okay, from the estimating equations. When we do it using our measures, we obtain that actually conditioning on everything else, households are consistent with uh, a mean variance uh, portfolio choice mode. Thank you very much. That's going to be the end. Thank you.